we're going to talk about critical chain uh, for 20 minutes uh, because you'll see it popping up everywhere. And although the goal exists, which means you can better understand what the theory of constraints is in production, as Oded mentioned, critical chain, a brilliant book at, at the time, does give you uh, only gives you a very partial idea of what critical chain is. Okay, so here's the. Uh, a quick introduction. To present myself at last, I'm, my, I'm Philip Maris. I founded 13 years ago Maris Consulting. And as you might have worked out from the logo, I'm kind of interested in the theory of constraints. And I've been doing it for a while. And one of the few people who've been doing it uh, longer than me is in, is in the room, Oded. Uh, it all went back to when, for as far as I'm concerned, when uh, Ellie Goldratt published The Goal and, uh, and we were selling software called Opt and stuff. Um, one of the uh, particular things about me, maybe, is that in fact I fell in love with Lean two years before I fell in love with Opt. Uh, at the time it was called Just In Time and it was in its infancy. Uh, and I've always been fascinated by that cocktail, in fact, uh, of what Toyota did and how it all ended up in startups and hospitals and whatever and uh, the theory of constraints. So uh, I, I enjoyed playing with that cocktail in various environments. And I've been doing it for a while. Um, so the critical chain, um, one of the strange things about it is the results are simply unbelievable. And people who uh, are doing projects and have never heard about critical chain, if you start with this sort of comment, they will just shut down and forget it because most people working in projects who don't know critical chain assume that since it's a project it's going to fail right it's normal that's a project right whether it's a tunnel or a plane or whatever or a building you know it's a project that's why it's going to fail it's going to take longer it's going to cost more it's a project right they don't understand and it's proven throughout the world now and in all kinds of projects you can finish on time within budget within specifications and so forth okay so uh, and you've seen some examples, you'll see some more. Uh, this book by uh, Kathy Austin and, and Jerry Kendall is just one of them. There are uh, a half a dozen excellent books about the subject. It so happens that in this book, they took the time to look at the 60 documented cases in 2013 about uh, critical chain, and they calculated the average. So you have an average drop in project durations of 39%, okay? And you have an increase in the productivity or the efficiency, which you can measure in different ways. It's always difficult in non-repetitive environments to work out how much you gain because other projects you're doing now are the same as before. But let's say you get an over 50% increase in the efficiency of your, uh, uh, the way you do projects, okay? And you finish them on time and you have the specifications, all that put together. So, what is it? Um, it really is very simple. How does one do a project? Let's take a project of developing a new product Okay, keep it very simple. Uh, and we have four stages, the proof of concept, uh, the prototype, and the pre-series. Okay, so we have a, a, a new car that's gonna run on, on the water. And so we go to see the guy doing the proof of concept and we say, we've got this new product. I'd like you to do the proof of concept. Uh, how long will it take you? Uh, it's urgent, it's the new priority. Uh, we think it's gonna save the company and so forth. So uh, he looks out the window, um, maybe uh, thinks about it, uh, and gives him the same answer he did last time, which was four months. Okay? Right. Okay. Uh, so he goes to the guy in charge of pr prototypes, and he says to him, if I bring you this uh, new project in four months' time, how long is it going to take you to do the prototype? Right? Well, he's got no idea what he's going to be doing in four months' time, and he doesn't know what the product looks like yet, right? <coughs> so he looks out the window, or maybe he uses Excel to impress his boss, okay? And he says, I think it'll take me 16 months. Okay. So then he goes to see the guy who's in charge of the, uh, the pre-series, and he says, if I bring you this project, this new car that runs on water, in 20 months' time, how long will it take you to do the pre-series okay well he doesn't even know if he's going to be there in 20 months time but uh, and he thinks about it and uh, he says uh, 18 months 
And the boss goes, man, I'm sorry, this is a strategic project. Blah, 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 blah. I'll only give you 12 months. So you end up with 12. Okay. And so we run the project. Okay. And we start the project. And we end up over here somewhere, yeah? <laughs> right? Very, very late. Uh, there's somebody in the room who uses the pi factor. I won't worry until it's 3.14159 times the, the due date and the budget. Okay. Um, so that's the way we run projects, and everything. Everybody thinks it's perfectly normal, right? Who knows? We've never done it before. It's normal we fail. It's normal that we explode the budgets, and that's life. So, uh, well, Goldratt did his thing on it, right? With a, a very simple first question, which is, what is the only date that is of actual any importance to the system? Well, it's when you finished, right? You don't give any importance to the dates internally, right? What you're interested in is when the project will be finished, okay? That's the only date we're going to have. And then you think about how uh, that global objective has been uh, converted into local optimums or local targets. And think back to the question about the proof of concept. Maybe more than other things, the proof of concept is something that's quite hard to calculate how long it's going to take you, right? You know, this new thing, this new idea, uh, you might find it's easy and it works and you might find it's impossible and you have to own up 10 months later that it's a no-go. Um, so what did the guy actually mean when he said four months? Well, he's working on the, con on, on the principle that he's going to have a problem if he doesn't meet his engagement, his commitment of four months, right? So he doesn't actually calculate the time it takes to prove the concept. He gives uh, what he thinks will be an acceptable answer to his boss. And since we're working in an area with no numbers, he basically gives him the same answer as last time, four months. Right? And they walk off, one and the other, not t wanting to talk about it again. Uh, but it was stupid. The, the next, guy, next guy is the same. Right? He didn't actually calculate the number of hours divided by the teams and whatever to calculate 16 months. Okay? And... Um, um, so what, we, what they s we say is that because of the way the question was asked, we asked for a commit commitment in an uncertain world, okay, they took their buffer, their local protection, and they added it to the time, right? So if we go back to exactly the same problem but ask the questions differently, we ask that person, how long would it take you in focused duration, that's to say, if you only had that project to do with your team, okay, what would be the average time it might take you? Half the time you can take more, half the time you might m do it faster, okay? This is no longer a commitment. You're allowed to take more time than expected, okay? And when you do th that, it's true that empirically, we've people have noticed throughout the world and throughout projects, you will get times that are about half of what was... Uh, previously given as the time taken to do a task. Okay? So what you do in critical chain is you keep what's called the focus duration. If I have a full kit of information, if I have nothing else to do, uh, how long would it take me? On average, you put those times together okay, and you have some kind <coughs> of project. You know that's impossible, okay? and so you add a buffer at the end that belongs to everybody, and that's the principle of the critical chain. Okay? So off you go. That is the planning, that is how you do the planning. When you execute, you will identify the critical chain, which is a sequence of, of uh, tasks, taking into account the resources doing it, that determines the uh, project duration, and you will add a buffer. And as Christine beautifully uh, represented, the, the relay race principle is that the sequence of those tasks, well, you mustn't waste time on that sequence, right? So. There's a, a principle of, for instance, the mascot, which we often use, where physically each project is represented by a strange object which moves around uh, the, the organization to make sure that it, it never stops anywhere. Okay? And that's an example of various mascots in various forms that we've used. Uh, a big, remarkable object. Execution, the fever chart you've seen in many, many, on many occasions. This is the critical chain, so the start of the project and the end of the project. And that is the buffer consumption up here, okay? 
And so when you execute, it's perfectly normal that you will consume the buffer, right? And in this example, they consume it a bit at the beginning, uh, but it's all going okay. Suddenly, in the middle of the project, they have a real problem. They do not progress any further, okay? So they're just consuming buffer until it gets into the red zone. They look at it, they react, they take the, the, the corrective action, and off they go, and they finish like that, for instance. Okay? And as you've seen already, and you'll see some more, this is not just a, an academic exercise. This is what you should be looking for, and people do it all the time. With an interesting point, which is to finish all your projects on time, you should try and finish them all early, right? That's the only way in an uncertain environment you will finish them all on time. The zones, the colors, are just empirical uh, to give you an, uh, a, a management code, very simple. Green, don't touch. Yellow, watch out. Red, do something. And the fascinating thing, and it took me a while when I was on my critical change journey to realize this, if you plan all the single projects like I just described, what is the problem with the portfolio? Since each individual project has already got a very good chance of finishing on time. Okay? So that maddening madhouse of a uh, meeting, which is usually called project management office portfolio management, where nothing is decided, nobody knows what's going on, and it's just pure madness, becomes something where you basically have a KPI that's the size of a postcard, where 80% of your projects are on time or going to finish early, and you just have to talk and decide what to do about a few projects. Okay? As simple as that. And it would sound like madness. You've already seen one person doing it. There's basically going, you're going to have eight examples from various industries of why it's possible, whatever the kind of project you're running. Okay? Um, then, theory constraints. You have to work out in a portfolio what is the critical check, what is the, uh, the, the constraint, the capacity resource in it. And it's a fascinating uh, subject because sometimes you will find a 500 person organization doing projects developing a new engine with one person as a constraint and 499 non-constraints. Okay? That's what we've seen. Uh, I see some people nodding their heads. Uh, the beauty of the theory of constraints is the, the constraint's got a, a name and a surname. <laughs> okay? And once you've decided that, you've got to make sure you keep the work in progress, progress down because one of the killers, the main killers in uh, project management is multitasking, doing several different projects or trying to do several projects in the same day. Finally, something which we believe is not talked about enough uh, is the process of ongoing improvement. Uh, what you do once you're executing is you note down why you consume the budget, the, the, the buffer, right? It took me six days instead of two, why? Okay, and you have a simple Pareto category system and you ask people to say what's going on. And what is strange is that we started off saying the variability was because, you know, it's a new idea, how long is it going to take me to get the, the right idea and stuff. That is variability. Okay, that's what we thought the problem was. Okay, and this is an average of uh, about 12 of our clients. We disguised the data a little. The real problem was unidentified tasks. They had uh, work breakdown pa packages which didn't have all the tasks. And suddenly, oh, I didn't know I had to do the quality documentation. And oh, whatever, whatever, right? Unidentified tasks. Incomplete deliverables. People trying to do the job without the specifications, without the designs, and whatever waiting, multitasking with some other projects and so forth. Anyway, what we thought was the problem turns out not to be the problem. So you can get to a stage where in fact all the madness of management in project management disappears and new problems turn up. Not the ones you were expecting, but new problems turn up. Okay? What a uh, critic chain uh, cannot do. It's very good at executing uh, projects quickly and finishing them on time. If it was a stupid product, it will st remain a stupid product, okay? So uh, it's just a, a, a logistical system to finish everything on time. If it was a very stupid idea, you just get it very quickly and efficiently, okay? So personally, we believe that things like lean engineering are very interesting. Uh, to make it uh, producible, manuf to make it, I mean, I've got a few people from the aircraft industry. It's, it's very difficult to make the planes that they designed in the past five years, isn't it? Uh, so why not try and make things easier to build and, and manufacture? And 
Uh, the other thing is, it's the rules we've just applied, you can apply it to your own organization, right? Go to see somebody and say, you know, tell me how long it will really take you, focus, and I won't, I won't get upset if you're late or whatever. If you're doing it with an outside sub subcontractor, that's going to be a problem. You've got uh, the world expert on the subject here, Ian, who's going to present about that and what you do about it. Okay, so that's critical chain. It sounds complicated, but uh, think about it. If you had to go from here uh, to Huasi Airport to take an aeroplane, and you didn't want to miss the plane, how would you do it? Okay, uh, assuming you're going to take a car, okay, you get out of here, you drive to the périphérique, and you get to the périphérique. If you'd planned to take 15 minutes to get to the périphérique, but you had green lights and it took 10, what would you do? Would you stop for five minutes saying, I'm ahead of schedule? No. Okay. Yeah, right. Anyway, you get the message. Um, how would you manage the project to make sure that you finished on time? You would expect to spend 20 minutes, 40 minutes in the waiting lounge wait in front of the boarding gate, right? You know that personally as a project, if you have to succeed your project, what you do, you have the buffer at the end and it will absorb variability. That's all it is with the uh, consultant slides, right? It's very, very simple. Anyway, it can do all kinds of projects. Uh, you're going to have quite a big uh, range of them. We're going to see Embraer with MRO, new product development, uh, software development with Wartech. Uh, you're going to get a wide range of that. Okay. And um, we don't have time for questions, I think, because I've just finished. <laughs> I uh, well, we have a one minute question. I, I have uh, many faults apart from being a consultant. I have verbal diarrhea. So um, the interesting thing, I think, to put it this way, is that in manufacturing, there is something called lean manufacturing, and consultants and experts will tell you you have to choose between one and the other, and so the goal has a tough time getting into factories. Okay? In projects, there is no competition. You either fail your projects or you use critical chain. So it's having a wonderful time. Uh, and it's now being used by, for instance, Mazda to develop all its cars uh, from A to Z, uh, and they're very happy with it. And all over the place, have a look. Uh, it's uh, being used in many, many large and small companies, and it works. Okay, and you don't have a choice anyway, so you just choose. Questions? One question. Good. Right. <laughs> uh, oh, Spiros. Philip, in the first presentation of uh, Christine, <coughs> uh, CCPM was used to speed up the the welding uh, the welding process, the welding function. Yes. Was that a project? Uh, it was a project in the, the level of variability. It was more uh, the question of using the relay race principle because it was a sequence of events that were in different departments, production and quality, and since, of course, production and, quali and quality don't speak to each other, uh, having the mascot, it's not specific to your factory, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, it was just a very good way of getting a pro pr uh, production and quality department to work uh, on the relay race principle. But it wasn't as such, a, I would agree, a principle. But the, you've got to understand that the theory constraints, the concepts we've been describing, that they just tried to, to, to summarize, you then adapt them to what you have in front of you. And uh, the, uh, the constraint in a sequence of tasks is defined by the critical chain, right? So we use critical chain in production, and, and we quite often do. Mm -hmm.